Hi, I'm Eddie O'Beng and I, I'm delighted, I, I really am, to be here with you at the IT Symposium. Wonderful timing. Gartner, best in the world. They figured out that we need to get together in order to actually understand what to do next. We've made it through the first phase. How do we keep people going? And so they've asked me to talk about persuasion and how you can keep your colleagues moving as you compose the future, the real digital future you have in mind. Quick joke first. All the CEOs I spoke to during the, uh, the crisis, once, once it had hit, they all said the same thing to me. They said, it's amazing how well our technology and our capability digitally allowed us to transition and carry on with day-to-day -day business. And I just burst out laughing every single time. I mean, basically, over the years, they've given you guys trillions in order to spend on technology, and they never believed it would work. It's, it's either that or you guys have done an amazing job. It's one of the two, but it's hilarious either way. Anyway, about me... Um, I spent half of my life really preparing for this world, uh, this world of change and so on. So uh, when the um, pandemic hit and everyone was locked down, it didn't really affect me as much as probably affected a lot of people. And that's because I've been thinking about digital world and new ways of working for quite a while. Um, over here behind us, um, that's a representation of my super real uh, world. It's called Cube. I live there as an avatar. I don't know if you can see that. Yep, you can. A little green, a little orange boxy thing there. I live there as an avatar and I've been using it for about 10 years now to both transform organizations and increase their productivity and to teach executives to learn. Average team, put them in super reality, productivity goes up two to five times without trying. The learning retention doubles. Super reality is quite a fascinating thing because it looks like virtual reality, but it isn't. Um, and some, in terms of some of the solutions which I'm going to share with you about persuasion, um, my bestseller here, All Change, it basically uses Socratic thinking. It's a question-based method, which I'll be sharing with you. So that's me. I, I'm, I'm not one of these people who suddenly popped up and said, I'm now a guru on the new normal. I've been doing it for quite a while. There's a TED Talk you could watch, someone who looks just like me, same name as well. Anyway. So that's what we're going to do. And I want to do it differently because everyone these days is doing their virtual presentations very seriously, very professional with their little slides and so on. I want to do it like a bit like an MTV show, you know. So I'll talk a little bit and then I'll pose and then I'll switch to the virtual super world and then I'll come back and I'll, I, I don't know. We'll have some fun. Anyway, let's start. So there's been a fire. We could um, smell the smoke and see the flames. Everyone got very flexible. Um, so whether you were at the leading edge of digital transformation or whether you were pushing against your, your colleagues and uh, your clients, either way, everyone got flexible through that period where they had to survive and uh, recover. But now, of course, they think the transitional ar arrangements are the end game of what the future you're trying to compose. And they're all sort of slipping back, the politics, all that stuff's coming back. So you need to continue to move them forward. You need to persuade them to continue to perform. How on earth do you do this? How do you make it work effectively? Um, story. How easy it is to get, get it wrong. I had lunch once with a, an FT100 CEO and he said to me, he said, Eddie, this organization I've moved into, he's just taken over a new organization. What I find is that people are really resistant to change. So of course I asked, how do you know they're resistant to change? And he replied, well, I keep changing things and they keep resisting. This is what had happened. He'd gone into the organization and said, these are the things we need to change. And they said, we're doing that already. He said, no, 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 these are the things we need to change. He said, no, we're doing that already. So he got frustrated. He said, right, customer for our focus, I'll fire you. So of course they didn't know how to do it. They weren't doing any of the things, you know? So hair on fire, running around, we present to him, roadmap to customer focus, PowerPoint, blah, 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 blah milestones, etc. So he goes, right, value for money. Value for money, I'll fire you. So they go, oh my goodness, they don't know how to do it. New PowerPoint, run back to value for money, or present. Okay, great. Now, global focus. Global focus, I'll fire you. So of course, now they've discovered that when the boss comes along and scares you, okay, if you present some stuff and wait long enough, you'll go on to the next priority, and you can go back to what you were doing before. And that's what he's seen as resistance, but was it them, or was it his approach? It is so easy to get blocked when you're trying to persuade people to change. 
And I'm going to talk you through that as part of this presentation structure. Let me flip. I'll show you um, just quickly. Uh, I'm going to jump to my one of my, my classrooms in Super Reality. So this is what the classroom used to look like before I, I moved it onto uh, into a Super Reality environment. Now you might say, Super Reality, what's the difference between that and Virtual Reality? Well, the difference is Virtual Reality is doing its best to try and copy what's here, where Super Reality is saying what's missing in the real world, which we could take advantage of. So for example, in the real world, if you had a whiteboard, like this whiteboard we've got over here, um, the chances are that you wouldn't be able to, for example, search the whiteboard, or the whiteboard would just be a, a single whiteboard. But of course, in super reality, you can have as many whiteboards as you like. So as you can see to the right-hand side of this, um, there are all these tabs here, and each one of these tabs, of course, is a different whiteboard. And if you want to know what's on the board, you can quite easily just um, uh, search it and find out all the stuff which is on there. Just like looking around your room and having a search button. So anyway, this is the journey we're going to go on. Very, very straightforward. Um, I started already by setting you a, a situation around the, the basic pitfalls of trying to persuade people. i give you that example. Now I want to explain what persuading to perform is about, and there are three steps to it. I'm going to walk you through that, and then I'm going to try to explain how to use technology. But let me explain more about these pitfalls and the, the failure. You see, human beings aren't designed for change. In fact, we're almost designed for the opposite of change. Um, okay, and... Um, <laughs> We, we, we have to do that because we have to try and figure out how to survive. So let me just flip back to here. Um, the best way to explain it is, do you feel like one person? Do you feel like, yes, I'm me? Okay. So of course you do. You feel that you are one person. That's you. You have an identity. Yes, it's me. Bad news. You're not one person. In fact, what you know is that your brain has two halves. Okay. And we've discovered through research and things that when people have accidents and the nerves between the two halves are split, one half can do something, the other half doesn't know what's going on. Also, your heart, your heart beats all the time, bum, 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 60, 70 times a minute, whatever it is. Um, but your brain isn't telling your heart what, when to beat. And your guts, they digest your food quite happily, but the, there's no brain, act, okay, but there's this big bus between the two called the vagus nerve. And so the whole thing, despite having multiple processes, feels like one me. Now, why is this important? Because this me sort of pulls all the elements together and most importantly, it keeps you alive. It tells a story about you, about your past. It says how brilliant you've been all the way through your past, okay? And it says what wonderful things you're going to have. Why? Because if you're going to survive in the tough world, remember for millions of years we lived in a tough world, when the saber-toothed tiger bursts out of the bushes, coming to eat you, you have to fight and run because you think you're worth it. Or in L'Oreal speak, because I'm worth it, okay? So you have to do that. So it has to tell a great story about it. If it says, oh, you're not so great, you know, if it ate your leg, it wouldn't be a problem, then you wouldn't survive. So this is crucial, but it gives us two massive headaches. The first is that everything which we hear which tells us that that story is correct, it's called confirmation bias, we think is brilliant. That's why we say things like, what you said resonated with me. And then we like people who say things which resonate with us because it makes us feel great. Bad news, somebody comes along and they tell you something which is completely different from what you were expecting. That's what happened to my CEO. He gave them bad news. What you're doing is a pile of rubbish. You know, you should be doing this. So we have a subroutine in our brain which literally stops you hearing what's going on. And if you do hear it, it has a little subroutine at ROMs called cognitive dissonance where it rewrites what's been said in order to come out with the solution that, yes, you were worth it all along. And so this is why we get this barrier to change. And everyone has it. So when you're trying to persuade people, if you just go at them, sometimes they'll say, so what you're saying is we should all be digital and we should never do, and, and you go, no, no, I didn't say that. Have you had that experience? What's happened is you've just triggered them to start to respond. You see, the way we're designed is that um, if, if there's a change going on, I'm going to try and draw this and I hope it doesn't look too much like Homer Simpson. Yeah, it's not too bad, okay? Um, but there's a piece of software in your neck, just about here, at the bottom of your, your neck, and it has one job. It just checks for change. If everything is the same, it says relax. The moment's called the amygdala. The moment anything changes, this software literally does three things. It switches off your logical brain. Why? Because thinking is always going to be too slow. Then the other two things it does is it makes you really, really, really scared. And this is my attempt to do like a munch, okay? And then it fills you full of adrenaline from other parts of your body. That's what we're designed to do. Why is this important? Because when your brain is off and you're scared, do you become creative? 
No. What happens? You become cunning. Remember my story? They just presented stuff to make it look like they were moving forward. They weren't moving forward at all. So you might ask, how come human beings ever create anything? Well, because there's a second piece of software in your neck, up slightly higher up. And that one is to do with hunter-gathering being a poor business to be in. None of you are in that business anymore. Basically, you're usually hungry. Why? Because your brain burns energy 10 times faster than your muscle. And so when the brain's busy thinking, this software acts like a policeman. and goes, hey, brain, I can see you working. I would like you to fall in love with your idea and turn it into more food. Okay? Now, why is that important? Because that's why all your own ideas are so brilliant to you. Had you noticed that? Of course, yeah? Why am I telling you this? Because this is fundamental to making sure that you can persuade effectively. There are really just three steps to it. And I'm going to walk you through those three steps with real life examples. So if you come back into my classroom for a second, um, the one I'm going to share with you is this one here. This was getting people's attention, and this would have happened to you. You are bound to remember where you were or what you thought when you heard those words, which were, <laughs> I'm going to build a wall. <laughs> you probably thought immediately of a cracked wall or a castle wall or a prison wall or maybe the wall they built. It was a visual statement. It was simple as important, and it got your attention. Getting people's attention is step one in persuasion. If you get their attention, things happen. Another story, which will give you, get you to the next stage, and we're living this, and this is part of how to make sure your persuasion works to perform. My father-in-law, um, as you know, with this horrid COVID thing, he, he gets very stressed because of this particular image. What's the image of? The image is of um, COVID, basically the virus. And he says to me, I don't understand, you know, all this stress and all these worries, you know, I, I just don't get it. Now, I want to just try and walk you through why people are so scared and in terms of reacting to COVID. So I've got on this um, uh, laptop over here a little picture. My father-in-law is about 80. So when he sees something which looks like that, he has a memory of this thing. It's a floating sea mine. Are you with me? Sea mines are dangerous things. If you saw them on the beach, you have to run like crazy. Okay. And so I googled flu virus. And I got this type of picture. You can see the picture. Oh, look, even a little smiley, funny face over here. Blues and greens and so on. But when you Google coronavirus, guess what? It comes out all red. Why? This is a scanning electron microscope photograph. Electrons are smaller than photons. Viruses have no color. So why is the virus red? Because if you have to persuade 7.2 billion people, the color you choose is red. So we know things like colors can be very persuasive. We know this is something which happens. But it's possible that they've persuaded us and scared us a lot. And that's why we have to have more and more pressure on us. I mean, where I live, for example, all the ambulances go through all the time. They, in the old days, they never had their sirens on. Now they have them on all the time because that's the way they're going to generate compliance. So you understand, as a leader trying to drive this change and make us safe, you end up going down the fear route and you're going to keep going. So you're saying, Eddie, 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 what are you suggesting? They should have just given us the facts. Would we have behaved ourselves if they'd given us facts? Um, well, actually, no. Um, an experiment I did once was I got a group of executives uh, to keep diaries for a week of what they were doing. Then we waited for four months, and then we saw how effective they'd been over the four months. And it was about 15% of their time in a week, and they were all working really till quite late at night. So I presented it as data to them. And they all went, oh, that's terrible, terrible. Nothing, nothing happened. The CEO went, oh, that's terrible. And then I changed it from data to a story. And I said to them, well, you know how you have a high workload, so you don't have time to plan or to do or to be creative. So you don't realize how much work you're committed to. So you say yes more than realistic, which pushes your workload up, giving you less time to plan or to do things. So sometimes you come close to goals other people think are important. These other people want to meet their goals, so they interrupt you. So you spend a lot of your time restart to starting half-done jobs, which pushes your workload up, giving them less time to plan to do or to be creative. So people now know you're disorganized and they can interrupt you and get away with it. Have you noticed that happening to your colleagues? And they all laughed. And now I had their attention, so I could say, well, why is it? You've got these stretching, challenging targets, you keep doing things the same way. So by going from facts to a story, suddenly I got their attention. This is a Socratic story, it has causalities, and that's what I put into the book, All Change, which I mentioned earlier, which is why it became a bestseller. Because you can use persuasion in things like Socratic approaches. There are other methods you can use. For example, we know that 
Um, if you're going to persuade people, a good trick is to tell them other people are doing that same thing. Um, we know that, for example, people respond much better when there's a contrast to what's, being, what's going on. So if I said to you, and we can't help it as human beings, we really have no, no control over it. Uh, if I said to you over here, um, uh, which of these two graces, gray squares is darker? Of course, you tell me the one on the left. But I've hidden over here in this bar somewhere. If I can find it. Yeah, there you go. I found a square. See, those two squares are the same color. And now I'm just going to slide across. Oh, they're the same color. You see, what happens is our perception is quite, quite unbalanced. So things like contrast have a massive impact on us. So things like getting people's attention by saying you're going to build a wall. Things like this one here is one of the ways in which a chap I follow on Twitter is using to try to persuade people to go to remote work. Contrast. He says, office work. I, I write for 30 minutes a day, um, remote work. So basically, he uses contrast. This one here says, I write, you know, etc. He's got somebody. But what you're trying to do all the time, they go, I told you, they, what you're trying to do all the time is you're trying to make sure people are continue to move forward. So, my question to you you now understand a lot about how to get people's attention. I really need you to think about how you're going to get your colleagues' attention. And now we're, to, we're going to talk about persuasive methods, because you need to get the attention using the methods, but you also need to use the methods effectively for trying to get people to change. So let me flip back here. Let me make this a bit bigger, because it's a bit small. There you go, plus, plus, plus. Okay, so at the top of this diagram, always, 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 is big fear. Big fear, make it bigger even bigger, because it's big fear. Big fear, big fear. Big fear is at the top. Why? Because if you can threaten people with death, loss of livelihood, catastrophe, guilt, etc., they always become more flexible, as we have seen. But we now learn through research, people like Robert Cialdini and so on, they've explained things like if you give somebody something over here, reciprocity, they give you something back. Don't ask me why it's one of those monkey things. Uh, contrast, we've talked about identity. If I said you should really persuade to perform, versus. As a CIO, as an IT lead, you're the sort of person who would always persuade to perform. You wouldn't just persuade so people get stuck. Do you see the difference? By appealing to your identity, I have you. Okay? Um, then there are things like scarcity. You've probably seen that lots with sales things, colors we've talked about. Cadence. I live in the UK. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, I live in the UK, and um, in the UK, what we did was we actually voted for, for this thing called Brexit based on simply on cadence, you know, take back control, and we're gonna take back control, and we all went and did it, you know, fake news over here, man bites dog, you know, all the fake news, we go, oh my goodness, you know, dogs bite men, men don't bite dogs, but we know that if the thing is a bit strange, oh, you can't cope with it, things to hear like questions, questions are really quite amazing, because they hit that bit of software, and you buy into it by accident, so there's this huge range, repetition, I keep saying, Persuade to perform. Persuade to perform. <laughs> Have you noticed? So there's this huge range of things you can do. And what I'm going to share with you now are a couple of the methods which I use to make sure that the persuasion is effective. So one, we know how to get attention. We use some of these things to help. But you can then combine them as ways of making sure people move forward. And I'm going to do it in two steps, as you saw from my earlier presentation. Um, I'm going to try to show you how to make it happen, but I'm also going to make sure that you get the gold. What do I mean by that? S uh, some people try and persuade, and they do succeed, but what they're persuading people to do is actually the wrong thing, okay? So you have to check, and this is how it is always in every child's story, you're persuading people to do something dangerous, but there has to be gold there, because the gold is always under the dragon, as I describe it. So somehow or other, we have to check that. So I'm going to show you how I do the checking that the gold is under the dragon. I've combined a number of methods. Um, in this case, contrast plus questions, allowing people to actually show with through their own identity and have some autonomy, which all are things which persuade you persuade yourself. So here we go. So this is a meeting I had a couple of weeks ago um, with some people from a university. Uh, that's today. Example, example, good. Okay. So um, <laughs> they were from a university and I said, what, what's the challenge? And they'd come because they wanted to understand about super reality. I said, tell me what your challenge is. And they said, oh, we don't have a way to be sure students will be engaged as we move to working virtually. And I said to them, Oh, my goodness. Okay, each of you write a sticky note saying what you think will happen if you don't fix it, if not fixed. 
So of course they told me things like, well, students won't get through their coursework, students might lose mental well-being, we'll have to work super hard with them, we might have dropouts, uh, some of them might fail their exams, as lecturers will be demoralized, um, the businesses who use us will be upset, the university will lose prestige and might even lose income as well. Now they wrote those themselves in response to my question. Bang, I've hit them in the back of the neck. These are owned by them, okay? They know it's important. So I said, oh my goodness, that's terrible. Well, what would happen if it's fixed? Contrast. So they said, well, there's more learning, uh, better retention, there'll be visibility of workload, we'll know the students have to do it, we'll discover that it's asynchronous, we'll be able to reach students we couldn't have before, we'll discover the new normal's better, it might even be less expensive, uh, the college will maintain status, blah, 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 etc. Oh my goodness. So contrast, now they want to move, okay? So then I said to them, well, why haven't you done it yet? And they said, well, we haven't got a way of, of doing it. We assume we could control the students and we didn't really pay attention. Many key decision owners have said, wait till the autumn, which is where we are now. Created, um, not created a business case. I went, you're doing that now, but you don't know. Um, and we don't know how to communicate it. So I said, okay, if you don't fix it over the next year, how much money do you think you'll lose? Business case, guess what? Minus two million. And if we could fix it, what do you think the upside could be with all the savings and stuff? Oh, upside five million. You think they are giving them a value at stake of seven million? And I'm saying to them, well, okay, so how much is Cube gonna cost you? you know, I, the sale is made. In fact, they've made the sale to themselves. So that's the persuasion technique I use for making sure there's gold under the dragon. And then I move on to a second method, which is how you combine it so that you don't end up with big fear, which is self-limiting or could be unethical, but makes people actually own it and then deliver it afterwards. So the method I'm going to show you is again around another story, really simple story. It was a, an organization I worked with where they had to make massive changes, about 70% redundancies, huge, big change, okay? And um, I was talking to the CEO and, um, and he said, I've got to make all these changes. I've got to tell the shareholders, you know, big changes, 70% redundancy. I said, no, 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 what we should do is let's, let's think about it because you're in a unionized environment, it's a complex environment, regulated. Let's do it this way. How about if, First thing we do is we set up a little sort of process so we can get the message from the top to the bottom of the organization really fast. Why? Because I didn't want anyone gossiping. Then what we did was we brought everyone on day one and we told them literally what they already knew. We said, hey, this company has to change. You know, this is how the world was. This is how it's going, a bit of contrast. Um, this is what our competitors are doing. You know, this is where we are. This is what's going etc. We literally introduced the subject, but we only told them things they knew. We just introduced the issue and they left going, we knew all that. And we went, yes, why? Because we knew their brains were still on. We hadn't managed to trigger the amygdala crocodile bit and make their brain switch off. So we were going to get a good result, not a cunning result. Great. Then we brought them in for the second meeting. The second meeting, all we gave them was data. We gave them visual data. We gave them contrast data. You know, everything to try and get into their head. You're going, Eddie, you said data doesn't work. No, it doesn't. That's not what we're after. We're telling them the data because we're going to use the persuasion afterwards, but we want them to come up with the right outcome. So we gave them lots of facts, and they left the meeting going, oh, that's interesting, I didn't know that, blah, blah, blah. So facts, interesting facts, non-threatening, completely neutral. Then we hit them with the big one, which is basically the question. See, the thing about the question is it hits that bit of the software. What are you going to do? How should we work? What are the roles? So instead of presenting like you normally do, I'm the CEO, here's my vision. No, no, we ask them, what, what should the vision be? And as they went through the questions and we asked groups to think about the questions, slowly they began to create the questions and the answers for themselves in their own heads. So we ended up with a solution which basically meant that the faster somebody made themselves redundant, if they trained somebody to replace them, they got a bigger bag of money. Um, and what happened was, Therefore, people worked overtime to make themselves redundant earlier. And they all got jobs, because normally when you go for a job, you know how it is, you turn up for your job, they say, why are you looking for a new job? They say, you say I'm seeking new interests and challenges. They know you're lying. But these guys could really explain what had happened, because they knew what the situation was, they had all the facts, they had all the questions, and most importantly, we managed to get them to build the solution themselves. So, it's called IDQB. Um, and it's a really simple process. It works just like a treat, okay? And um, all you have to do is not break some of the rules. Here you go, IDQB. I'll just put it on another whiteboard. So, for example, make sure that you introduce the situation with no surprise. You're very concrete as you provide them with data. And then when you get to the question, use I's and use. What am I going to do? What are you going to do? What's different about the future for you or me? And if you do that, people then start to think, and then what you do is you leave them to answer it themselves. So IDQB is a very good way of trying to persuade people forward. 
So if I've done a good job so far, I've got you through the first two steps. I've highlighted the absolutely crucial importance of, um, of ensuring that you are, you, you've got people's attention. Here we go. Okay. And I've got you through that. I've told you about checking for the gold so you understand all of that. So I'm just going to finish with points on persuasive technology. So here's the headache we have with persuasive technology. People like BJ Fogg um, uh, have written books on persuasive technology. We know how addictive people get to their devices and so on. So it's, it's a real challenge. The headache with the persuasive technology, the nudge technology, the AI and so on, is it turns the people into basically uh, automatons. Um, that's why fake news, everyone gets so ex excited. And if you're not careful, you actually disempower the people around you. What you want to do is you want to often empower. You don't always want to, but you often want to empower people rather than enslave them. You want to enhance them. So that's why I use super reality. So I'll just tell you what happened. So this is a, a quick story. This is a chap who I, I came across. I was, I was in Scotland, in, 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 in Europe, and um, I saw this chap sitting at a desk. And when I went a bit closer to him, I realized that he was actually on cue in this environment because I recognized one of those whiteboards. So I stood over him and he looked at me because he had no idea who I was, totally bemused. I didn't know who he was either. Because on cue, one of the things we do is we disembody people. The avatars are all very simple. I think I've, you've seen this already. Really, really simple. Why? Can't tell whether male, female, etc. Why? Because introverts feel comfortable, because people approach each other, because you remove the hierarchy. What basically you're doing is you're creating like a parallel world for them. You see, you know how when you go abroad and uh, people say, well, in this country, what we do is you sit cross-legged and we eat with our right hands, you just join in. You don't, I mean, the persuasion happens automatically because the environment persuades you to behave a certain way. So that's what we do on cube. People arrive and say, oh, on cube, we don't all talk. We write first, we talk second. No one ever argues. They literally do what you say. So that's how I'm able to use it for teaching because even with senior executives, massive egos, I can get them to take on board all sorts of new things by creating from them a completely different um, uh, world environment. So that's what I do. Um, and if I come back and summarize the things which we've covered so far, that will be useful. If I've done a good job, you now understand about the absolutely crucial importance of trying to persuade people to move forward. If I've done a great job, then you've understood that there are three stages. Step one, get their attention. Simple message, visual message, any message with those persuasion tips in there, great. Step two, persuade. I'm going to put a link on cube.cc forward slash persuade, which will explain and share those methods I have. I mean, there are loads of them, things like identity. I mean, if you read about that, it's just super. People like the Dilbert guy, he talks a lot about identity. If you get that right, people just, they just do it because they think it's them and stuff like that. Um, and I hope I've done a good job. And then the third one is I've shown you how to use something like issue data question build, IDQB, to not just persuade people, but to get them to own it in their own heads and even do things like make themselves redundant. In technology terms, there are other platforms out there, but you really have to think about how you use your technology. And there we go again, to try to make sure that your people can be persuaded and continue to perform. So let's end then. There's an old story about the sun and the wind trying to get a coat off a traveler on a road. And the wind blows at the poor traveler, gets him cold, gets him wet. The traveler just pulls his cloak on tighter and then the sun shines and it gets so hot the traveler takes his coat off and persuasion is a little bit like that you have to realize that you're taking on this journey from getting their attention right the way through to choosing the right way to persuade them right the way through to them actually doing something themselves about it and i wish you the very best of luck and enjoy the rest of the uh, symposium thank you thank you bye